the world most honored watch is Longines. Longine watches have won 10 World Fair Grand Prizes, 28 gold medals, and more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is made and guaranteed by the Longines Whitmore Watch Company. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitmore Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitmore, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Henry Hazlitt, editor of the Freeman, and contributing editor for Newsweek magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable John V. Beamer, United States Congressman from Indiana. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Congressman Beamer, you uh, represent the 5th District, I believe, in Indiana, and that is the home of William Otis, who is now in the Czechoslovakian prison. And our chronoscope interest, our chronoscope audience is gravely concerned about the fate of Americans abroad and the treatment of Americans abroad. And I'd like you to tell us some of the background of that case. Yes, Mr. Hazlitt, uh, Bill Otis came from Marion, Indiana, which is in the 5th Congressional District that I have the privilege to represent. In fact, Marion is only 20 miles from my hometown of Wabash, which is on the banks of the Wabash. In April of 25, this last year, the newspapers and the press reported the disappearance of Bill Otis, and immediately I began to receive telephone calls, letters, and telegrams from the people in the district asking me to do something. Reported uh, his disappearance in Czechoslovakia. That's right, yes. reported his disappearance in Czechoslovakia. In fact, he was been sent over there as an Associated Press yes. correspondent. I learned that he was arrested in the State Department, I think it was on the following day, the 26th, reported that he had been in prison. And then it was early in May that I introduced the resolution in his behalf. In fact, I introduced several resolutions and had other members of Congress to do likewise. Now, so this, of course, is just another one of these uh, Americans that have been, in effect, grabbed as hostages by these Russian satellite countries. Isn't that correct? Well, yes, Mr. Huey, that's the way it appeared to us and the people back home. After all, Bill Otis is just another person who is being used, perhaps as a hostage, perhaps to use it for ransom purposes, or as many of us have felt to embarrass and to destroy the dignity of the United States. Yes, to cause us as a nation to lose face uh, in Europe, and then uh, just for trading purposes. The only case against him is that he's an American seized by our enemies to use for advantages against us. Well, of course, they said he was spying. Now, actually, yeah. if he was spying, uh, he was really gathering news the same as any other news reporter would be gathering, and if he was spying, a lot of people in this country could well, be... Well, they convicted. had a mockery of a trial, too, didn't they? they, had yeah. a, they yes, they had a trial. In fact, the matter is that none of the American uh, embassy officials were permitted to even to see him. And, and they, the, yes, they claimed they had a confession from him, too. Well, yeah. the chances are, and the reports seem to be quite true, that he was tortured in the usual methods of bringing a confession from him were secured at that, in that method. By the way, I might say that at the trial, the only two Americans present were seated at the back end of the room. And so we do have a transcript of the trap, which was taken in shorthand by one of those secretaries. Uh, but what was actually charged against him, really, was that he was doing his duty as a correspondent, more or less, and getting the news. Wasn't that about it? That was from their point of view, however. They must get the news directly from their sources and probably serve as a propaganda agent. Now, that's not the way we get the news in this country. Well, our audience then can understand that here is an American doing his duty in, an, in a foreign country. He's suddenly seized and thrown into jail and subjected to torture. Now the question becomes, what can we do and what are we doing about it, sir? Well, Bill, I'd like to get the congressman to tell us, first of all, perhaps what the background was, uh, what uh, actually has been done or has not been done. Now, Congress passed this resolution of yours, did it not? That's right. And what did that provide? Well, this uh, resolution, which was House Joint Concurrent Resolution 140, expressed the sense of the Congress that they should sever trade relations with 
Czechoslovakia. In other words, imposed economic sanctions. Uh, it didn't have anything to do at that time with the severance of diplomatic relations. Yes. And, and did the State Department do anything effective along that line? Well, they employed perhaps what we might term as a legal procedure, going through the general agreements on trades and tariffs, which didn't meet until September in Geneva, Switzerland. And at that time, they did secure the uh, consent of the signatory nations to, uh, with the exception of the satellite powers, of course, to sever their relations with uh, the uh, checks under the agreement on general agreement on trade and tariffs. I might add, by the way, that they haven't had very much result as a, as that a, as the effect of that. Well, the net result is that Otis is still a prisoner in Czechoslovakia. The sad thing is that he's still there and he's been there since last April. Yes. Now, sir, what can we do? As a nation, what what could we do now? Now well, you've recommended in your in your resolution one course of action. What about uh, severing uh, diplomatic relations with these people? Well, at the time, it was felt that perhaps the better part of wisdom was the uh, better part of valor was the wisdom that might be displayed in having another method to use, another so we say another string to our bow. In other words, if the economic sanctions that were proposed by this resolution, if they did not produce the results, and then a proposal to introduce, could be introduced, to sever relations with Czechoslovakia. Now, in your, in your efforts, sir, to get to Otis's release, uh, have you had uh, cooperation, satisfactory cooperation from the State Department? Well, frankly, I have had, uh, I feel, very weak cooperation. They have stated that certain things had been done rather in nebulous terms, and I still can't uh, report to you what they have reported to me. In fact, the matter is, of course, they did affect some changes through the general agreements on trade and tariffs, but even so, I want to point out to you that in 1951, several months were included in that year when they could have cut off relations, the Czechs still imported more merchandise to the United States than was imported the entire year of 1949 and nearly as much as they imported in 1950. So that has, they, they really haven't done much on that. And actually the Czechs now are asking, or the Czech communists are asking for a form of ransom, form of blackmail for the release of uh, Otis, aren't they? Well, does that seem to be a pattern they're following? Yes. For example, the they, uh, they asked 120,000, wasn't it, for the four fires? $120,000, yes. The four fires were put down in the, in Hungary, and remember the Vogler case? We had to make a trade there. They had too. to make a trade. I don't know the amount, but it's quite an enormous amount, of course, concessions there. And he'd been in prison for 17 months. And uh, I believe this is true, sir. I believe Mr. Vogler uh, gives credit for his release to the press and to his wife and gives no credit to the State Department for his release. Isn't well, that correct, sir? That's very true. In fact, Mrs. Beamer and I had the pleasure of meeting and spending an evening with Mr. and Mrs. Robert Vogler. And he very emphatically says that he must give credit not only to Mrs. Vogler, who worked untiringly and unceasingly for his release, but also to the press and the radio of this country that labored in his behalf. Well, Congressman, do you think we ought to pay ransom again for Otis, as we did for Vogler and for the four American flyers? I would uh, say emphatically no. There was a time in the early history of this republic when we were very small. And we did pay ransom and tribute to the pirates on the Barbary Coast. But even then, even then, you remember, the president sent Decatur with a small fleet of ships and to put a stop to that type of brigandism. I, I think it's quite beneath our dignity to even consider it, don't you? Well, well, then I'd like to ask this. I'd like to turn Mr. Huey's question around about breaking off uh, diplomatic relations with Czechoslovakia and ask, why should we continue such relations? What do we get out of it o outside of humiliation and insults and, uh, and uh, seizing and kidnapping of our representatives there? Well, uh, may I repeat the answer that's been given or rather the reason that they have given me in some instances. They say that as long as we have a diplomatic relations there in the country, we do have listening posts. But I question the validity of the strength of that argument because I just wonder how much they're getting or how much they're succeeding yeah. in that respect. Well, they have listening posts here by the same token, haven't they? And well, they I send think. over pretty skilled listeners who can put a mild term for them. Not only that, they have and access to everything they want. Yes, yeah, they have access over there uh, to everything, and here. while they're very, very restricted, extremely restricted in, the, in those countries, all yeah. our representatives are. Oh, yes, they're yeah. restricted even to the number of employees they can have. And, and, if, and you've just stated to our listeners, sir, that there are ways by which we could hit them in the pocketbook 
that we are not using. Isn't that correct? I feel that uh, one of the most emphatic ways to, step, uh, to affect this thing is to step up on the pocketbook of the tech. They need our American dollars, first of all, for the, well, for their weakened currency. And they need it for the propaganda purposes, even perhaps to send propaganda back here, which they're doing quite extensively. I see. Now, sir, our, uh, since Mr. Vogler says that the only way he got out of Hungary was because the American press and the American people uh, got him out, uh, suppose that some of our listeners would like to help get Bill Otis out. What can our listeners do as a, in a, as a practical manner to help? Well, there are a lot of things practical can do. Uh, it isn't necessary to write to me. I'm working as long as I can, as much as I can. I appreciate letters, and we've received many of them. I wish that every person who is interested in the dignity of the United States and in Bill Otis, and after all, may I interrupt, Bill Otis is more or less a symbol today. He isn't just a man anymore. He's a symbol of freedom of speech and freedom of press, even freedom of life. I'd like for every person to write to President Truman and to Secretary of State Atchison and insist that they take some positive action rather than just a slap on the wrist. Well, I'm sure that our audience has very much appreciated this, hearing your views tonight, sir, and thank you for being with us. The editorial board for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Henry Hazlitt. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable John V. Beamer, United States Congressman from Indiana. The Winter Olympic Games, recently completed at Oslo, were exclusively timed by Longines to one-tenth and a hundredth of a second. Our reward was this telegram. Longines equipment used for all timekeeping during the Winter Olympic Games of 1952 all worked perfectly. Thanks for your valuable cooperation. Signed, the organizing committee. Now, that's a wonderful telegram, and we're all ever so pleased. Longines was actually official watch for the three great Olympic sports events of the year. The Winter Olympic Games at Oslo, the third Bolivarian Games at Caracas in Venezuela, and the first Pan American Games held in Buenos Aires in Argentina. And now we're proud to announce that the United States Olympic Committee has selected Longines watches for timing all events for the selection of the United States Olympic team of 1952. So you see, wherever precise timing is important, in sports, aviation, and science, the preeminent choice of watches is Longines, the only watch in history to win 10 World Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and highest honors for accuracy from the leading government observatories. Longines, the world's most honored watch premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world's honored Longines. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. This is the CBS 